On a clear afternoon in Colorado, a JMBVL 3LSA 912 was flying routine touch and goes at Erie Municipal Airport. Inside were instructor Niles Tolinius, 22, and student William Johnston, 21, two young aviators building experience. But on the Fifth Circuit, the aircraft began a go around, climbed briefly, then suddenly spun nose down into the ground. No fire, no distress call, just seconds between normal flight and disaster. So, what really happened in those final moments? How does a simple go-around turn into a fatal spin? The NTSB preliminary report is out now, so let's take a look. According to the NTSB preliminary report, the aircraft had been performing a series of touch-and-go circuits at Erie Municipal Airport. A DSB data shows four of those circuits were normal. Textbook patterns, smooth transitions. On the fifth circuit, though, something changed. The data indicates the aircraft descended to around 5,600 feet MSL, roughly 500 feet above the ground, then began to climb again to about 5,800 feet. That's consistent with a go-around, a maneuver every pilot is trained to execute when the landing isn't quite right. But then... Almost immediately, multiple witnesses saw the VL3 level off, pitch up slightly, and then tumble, rolling nose down into a spin before impacting the ground east of the runway. There was no radio distress call, no explosion, and no fire. Just silence after impact. And that's what's truly chilling here. This wasn't a long, unfolding emergency. It was over in seconds. The NTSB has not yet determined a cause, and this script isn't about guessing. It's about understanding what might have been at play, aerodynamically and operationally, so we can all walk away a little wiser and pay respect by learning something real from their loss. Let's talk about the aircraft, because this isn't your typical trainer. The JMB VL3 is a European-built light sport aircraft known for its speed, sleek looks, and composite efficiency. It's the kind of plane that makes pilots smile just by sitting in it but it also demands precision. With a cruise speed around 160 knots true, a stall speed near 42 knots, and a climb rate approaching 2,000 feet per minute, the VL3 packs serious performance into a small frame. Its wing area, about 9.8 square meters, gives it a high wing loading. That's what makes it feel smooth at speed, but also means it bleeds lift fast when the air speed drops. And that's the real catch. This aircraft reacts quickly, both to the pilot's inputs and to mistakes. In a go-around, when you slam the throttle forward, the Rotax 912 engine responds instantly. But with that power surge comes torque, P-factor, and slipstream, all trying to roll and yaw the airplane to the left. In a heavier airplane like a Cessna 172, you have more mass and stability to buffer that. In a light sport like the VL3, the same forces hit you like a snap. So a maneuver that feels routine in a Cessna can become extremely demanding in this airplane especially if the pilot doesn't apply immediate right rudder or manages pitch just a bit too aggressively. That's not a criticism. It's a reminder that different aircraft speak different aerodynamic languages. And the VL3? It speaks fast and fluent. You have to keep up. Now, the weather that afternoon looked absolutely fine on paper. Clear skies, 10 miles of visibility, and winds from 280 degrees at 7 knots, gusting 15. No clouds, no precipitation, nothing that screams trouble. But when you dig a little deeper, there's nuance. Runway 34 at Erie lines up roughly north-northwest. Winds from 280 degrees mean a crosswind component of roughly 8 to 10 knots gusting across the runway from the left. For most GA airplanes, that's well within limits. But for a light sport aircraft, especially during a go-around, that crosswind means extra rudder pressure, constant corrections, and a higher workload. Add to that the field elevations around 5,120 feet MSL. Air density up there is thinner. The engine and wings don't perform quite the same as at sea level. The airplane still climbs fine, but your margins get tighter. Pattern altitude might be just 500 feet above the field. That's not much time to sort out an aerodynamic upset. So, yes, the weather was technically perfect. But from a control dynamics standpoint, the setup was quietly challenging. A responsive airplane gusty crosswind, thinner air. It's the kind of environment where the smallest miscoordination can sneak up on even the best pilots. 
And that's the point where the flight, the machine, and the environment all start to converge, setting the stage for what happened next. Now let's look at the go-around itself, because that's where everything seemed to happen. When a pilot decides to go around, the steps are simple in theory. Full power, positive pitch, clean up the airplane, climb out, and try again. But in practice, especially at low altitude, it's one of the most demanding maneuvers in flying. Here's what likely unfolded, aerodynamically speaking. As power was applied, that Rotax engine came alive almost instantly. Unlike older trainers that respond a, lo a little slower, this thing reacts now. The problem is, full power brings all the left-turning tendencies into play, torque, p-factor, and the slipstream effect, and they all hit at once. That's why right rudder isn't optional here. It's essential. At the same time, the pilot would have pulled the nose up to arrest the descent and begin the climb. That's normal. But with a high-performance wing and lots of power, even a few degrees too much pitch can drive the angle of attack dangerously close to critical. If flap retraction started early, before the aircraft had fully stabilized, it could have suddenly reduced lift and changed the airplane's pitch balance. That alone isn't catastrophic, but add the gusty crosswind from the left, and now the pilot is fighting opposite rudder and aileron forces while climbing at low speed. At maybe 400 to 500 feet above the ground, there's just no room for error. In light sport aircraft like the VL-3, incipient spin onset can happen in less than two seconds. And by the time you recognize it, you're already descending vertically. This is where the physics simply outpace human reaction time. The data and witness reports point to a quick loss of control, possibly from a steep nose-up pitch that developed into a left roll and spin entry. And once that happened at that altitude, recovery wasn't just difficult. It was physically impossible. That's the part that's truly heartbreaking about this kind of accident. The pilots probably never even had time to comprehend what was happening. This is where things get very real. Two pilots were in that cockpit, a talented young instructor and a student pushing his limits to improve. Both had responsibilities. Both were alert. And yet, the cockpit dynamic itself can work against even the best pilots. In a training flight, roles constantly shift. The student is focused on procedure, on muscle memory, applying power, pitching up, keeping the center line. The instructor, meanwhile, is scanning everything. Attitude, altitude, airspeed, power, the student's hands, the runway, other traffic. It's an extremely high workload, especially at pattern altitude. When something unexpected happens, a sudden roll, a yaw, or that split-second feeling of weightlessness, both pilots can experience the startle effect. The brain needs a moment to process what's happening. At 3,000 feet, you can afford that moment. At 300 feet, you can't. There's also what psychologists call expectation bias. After four perfect circuits, your brain subconsciously assumes the fifth will be the same. The pattern feels routine. You expect everything to behave as it did before. That's when small deviations slip through unnoticed. Now imagine the instructor realizes something's off. Maybe the nose came up too fast. Maybe the yaw feels stronger than usual, and he moves to correct it. But the airplane, being so responsive, reacts instantly. The left wing drops, the horizon tilts, and that's it. None of this is about blame. These are the universal human challenges of flying, especially in dual instruction. Every pilot, every instructor, has faced that moment where the airplane teaches a lesson faster than we can respond. And that's what makes this accident so profoundly human. Not a story of failure, but of how narrow the margin can be when skill, reaction, and physics collide. Now, a lot of people ask the same question after this crash. What about the parachute? The VL-3 was equipped with a Galaxy GRS ballistic rescue system, basically a rocket-launched parachute designed to lower the entire aircraft in an emergency. According to the preliminary report, investigators found that the safety pin was still installed in the activation handle. In simple terms, that means the system was never armed before flight, so it couldn't have been used even if they'd tried. To be clear, even if it had been armed, it's unlikely it could have helped in this case. These parachute systems require at least 600 to 700 feet AGL, and that's assuming a stable, upright attitude. In a spinning, nose-low descent below 500 feet, there simply isn't enough time or altitude for the parachute to inflate and stabilize the aircraft.
That's not to say the system is useless. Far from it. These parachutes have saved hundreds of lives when deployed early and at altitude. But they're not a magic fix for aerodynamic loss of control close to the ground. The real takeaway here is simple. Prevention beats reaction. The parachute is your last resort. The disciplined control of the airplane is your first. The aviation community has seen accidents like this before, and they always leave the same mark, a mix of sorrow and determination to do better. According to AOPA and FAA data, nearly one-third of all loss-of-control accidents in training happen during takeoff or go-around. And while they're not the most common kind of accident, stall spin events remain among the most fatal, because recovery altitude just doesn't exist in the pattern. That's why this accident hits so hard. The go-around feels like a recovery, like you're escaping a mistake. But in reality, it's one of the most complex, high workload phases of flight. You've got changing configuration, changing power, and changing lift, all at low altitude. It's the perfect storm for over-control. So what can we learn here? Without judgment, but with real honesty? First, right rudder discipline. In every piston aircraft, especially high-power LSA, you fight physics with your right foot. Neglect it, even slightly, and the airplane will start making decisions for you. Second, flaps. They're your friend until they're not. Retract them too early, and lift vanishes faster than you expect. Wait until you've got a positive climb rate and safe airspeed. Third, training environment. Erie sits at over 5,000 feet elevation. High altitude airports change how the airplane feels. Practice go-arounds where density altitude is high. It teaches you humility and smoother control. And finally, mindset. Every maneuver, even the fifth of the day, deserves the same mental readiness as the first. That's not paranoia, it's professionalism. As the NTSB continues its investigation, all we can do for now is reflect. This isn't about speculation. It's about learning through empathy. Two young men, Niles Tolinius and William Johnston, were doing what they loved, flying, teaching, learning. And even though this story ended far too soon, it reminds us why aviation safety is a never-ending journey. Until the final report arrives, our responsibility isn't to guess what happened. It's to make sure their story helps others avoid the same fate. Every circuit, every go-around, every climb-out is a new chance to fly smarter, not harder. And that's what this analysis is really about. Honoring them by understanding.